You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. This fall, Inspiration 4 launches as the first all-civilian mission to space. And you could be on board. Visit inspiration4.com for your chance to go to space. Dealing with COVID-19 is uncharted territory, and everyone has different challenges. People may feel anxious, down, or overwhelmed. For some, these feelings can lead to changes in sleep patterns, an increased use of alcohol or drugs, or withdrawing from the people around them. If you know someone who's having a hard time coping, you can help by reaching out to talk and listen. To learn more about how you can help someone in need, call the Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800-273-TALK. Some people look to the stars and ask, what if? Our job is to have an answer. We have to imagine what will be imagined. Plan for what's possible while it's still impossible. Maybe you weren't put here just to ask the questions. Maybe you were put here to be the answer. Maybe your purpose on this planet isn't on this planet. KLRN Radio has advertising rates available. We have rates to fit almost any budget. Contact us at advertising at klrnradio.com. Time for this nation to take a clearly leading role in space achievement, which in many ways may hold the key to our future on Earth. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Today is a day for mourning and remembering. Nancy and I are pained to the core by the tragedy of the shuttle challenge. The following program may contain coarse language, adult themes, and bad attempts at humor. Listener discretion is advised. What is President Trump's goal? What is his vision? He wants to put an American flag on Mars. Now I can say in less than a day we'll be underway on a mission to Mars. Theoretical themes, radical schemes, chasing our dreams on a mission to Mars. Welcome to The Lost Wonder for November 21st, 2021. Tonight, I am talking Russia. Seriously, it's pretty much going to be a show about Russia, at least for the first part. So, let's start with the biggest story of the last two weeks. Lego Education will be sending four Lego minifigures on a trip around the world. Okay, okay, that's not the that's not the top story. Sorry, sorry, Aggie. The t- real, real top story is Russia, as you may have heard, was in the news a lot this week. Some of what I may say here you may have heard prior, but the stories and information coming out after the initial report have been massive. During the reporting on this story, you may hear me go between p- different tenses and states of awareness on this matter, as I really had to sift through a lot of stories and, and, and pull from various sources to get all of this into a coherent, at least to me, uh, process. It started with astronauts on the space station had to seek shelter from a debris cloud, but its source at the time was unclear. Quote, U.S. Space Command is aware of a debris-generating event in outer space, U.S. Space Command told Space.com in an emailed statement. This debris, which the International Space Station passes through every 90 minutes, has caused the station's seven onboard astronauts to take temporary refuge in their Soyuz and Dragon Crew capsules. So yes, it was that worrisome that they were on board the Soyuz and Dragon capsules, ready to depart if necessary. Earlier today, the astronauts took shelter in their basically their lifeboat because of a short notice warning of potential debris. 
There then was also a rumor that the debris came from a derelict Russian satellite that experienced some sort of a fragmentation event, with further rumor that the fragmentation was caused by an ASAT test. Space policy expert Brian Whedon, a director of program planning at Secure World Foundation, told Space.com. However, Whedon did point to online reports from astrophysicist and satellite tracker Jonathan McDowell of the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics in Cambridge, Massachusetts, that showed that a dead Russian satellite was orbiting at an altitude somewhat close to that space station. And so, Whedon explained, if that satellite was targeted by an ASAT test, it generated a shit ton of debris that could affect the space station. I may have been the one that said the shit ton part. Reports that the debris could cloud or could be from Cosmos 1408, but nothing confirmed yet and no actual data available. McDowell tweeted, Cosmos 1408 is an old Soviet satellite that launched in 1982 and that has been essentially quote unquote dead for many, many years. Now, U.S. space industry analyst Sarah Data tweeted, the debris may have been caused by a missile test. Quote, ASAT missile strike now suspected. Sarah Data Space Track Database Orbital Data has Cosmo 1408 in a 487 by 461 kilometer orbit, a bit higher than ISS, but not by much, the company tweeted, referring to the old satellite uh, from the Soviet Union. The ASAT strike on Cosmos 1408 would cause some debris to be fired below it, threatening ISS with a crossing debris cloud. ASATs are high-tech space weapons possessed by just a few nations. Only the United States, Russia, China, and India have demonstrated the ability to shoot down their own satellites. India was the last to carry out such a test in 2019, creating hundreds of pieces of space junk strongly criticized at the time by other powers, including the United States. The United States shot down a satellite in 2008, and China demonstrated a similar knockout in 2007. NASA Chief Bill Nelson condemned the Russian ASAT test. Quote, I'm outraged by this irresponsible and destabilizing action, he said. Continuing, uh, earlier today, due to debris generated by the destructive Russian anti-satellite or ASAT test, ISS astronauts and cosmonauts undertook emergency production or procedures for safety, Nelson said in a NASA statement. Continuing more, I'm outraged by this irresponsible and destabilizing action with its long and storied history in human spaceflight. It is unthinkable that Russia would endanger not only the American and international partner astronauts on the ISS, but their own cosmonauts. Their actions are reckless and dangerous, threatening as well the Chinese space station and their technonauts on board, Nelson added. Now, in addition to the seven people currently living and working in the ISS, two Russian cosmonauts, three NASA astronauts, one European Space Agency astronaut, and one Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency astronaut, there are three crew members on board China's Tiangong space station. Pieces of a shattered Soviet-era satellite are visible in new telescope images after its destruction by the Russian anti-satellite weapon test. These images were captured by Numerica Corps, a Colorado-based company that provides tracking of space debris objects, and shared by the company's partner Slingshot Aerospace on Twitter. They show images and video of the debris in the wake of a direct ascent anti-satellite test by the Russians Monday that sent the missiles from the ground to destroy a defunct satellite called Cosmos 1408. Now, the telescope footage shows just some of the more than 1,500 trackable pieces of debris from Cosmos 1408 after its destruction by Russia. The U.S. Space Department, U.S. military officials, and, once again, NASA Administrator Bill Nelson are among the authorities condemning Russia for the act. And I'll try to see if I can get that picture and drop drop a picture of those uh, of it in chat for those listening to live. But to reinforce about the debris and space stations, the space station is said to be moving through the debris field every 90 minutes. It orbits a roughly 250 miles above Earth. Space debris tracker Leo Lab suggests a cloud of satellite pieces range in altitudes. Uh, between 273 miles and 323 miles above Earth. Now, China also has a low 
Earth orbiting Tiangong space station module, Tianhe, that currently has the three astronauts on board. Now, it is unclear if they took any special measures as a result of the incident. We may find out uh, on a future episode. But Tianyin's average altitude is roughly 229 miles. And Russia and the United States are major partners on the ISS. And their collaboration on the project dates back to the early 1990s. Although there have been some occasional spats between the countries. Including recent, that we've covered, reported threats by Russia to leave the ISS program in June. In August, NASA and Roscosmos said their collaboration is still strong despite a July incident that saw the newly arrived Russian Nyaka module accidentally tilt the space station by 540 degrees, causing, once again, a temporary spacecraft emergency. Now, the astronauts were in no danger at that, and NASA said at the time. Uh, it was thrusters misfirings on a Russian Soyuz MS-18 spacecraft that alerted the ISS orientation again in October uh, that was for about 30 minutes. Now, the 1,500 trackable pieces may not be the scariest part. Ned Price, U.S. Department of State spokesperson, had the following to say. The test has so far generate, generated over 15,000 pieces of trackable orbital debris and hundreds of thousands of pieces of smaller orbital debris that now threaten the interest of all nations. He added that this event has posed a serious threat to these seven astronauts currently in space. Let me, let me, let me say that. 1,500 pieces of trackable debris, but more importantly, the hundreds of thousands of smaller pieces they have no clue about. Now, Russia, their defense ministry said there is no threat to the International Space Station crews or nearby satellites. Bullshit. Sorry. Sorry, editorial comment there. Russia is fighting back amid criticism of the anti-satellite test Monday, November 15th, that forced the ISS crew into that shelter. Russia's Minita Ministry of Defense also issued a Russian language statement defending the test. The Minister General of the Army, Sergei Shogu, said that the test was successful and that the resulting fragments do not pose any threat to space activities. I'm going to get to, um, I think I'm going to need to have to come up with a Russia is asshole segment, aren't I? Does that mean I have to do a Don't Trust Russia theme song? But you know, no threat. Well, except for... Maybe this. The cloud of debris will increase the number of avoidance maneuvers performed by satellite operators all over the world by more than 100% in the next few years. Space debris created by the Russian anti-satellite missile test will pose a threat to satellites in low Earth orbit as well as astronauts aboard the ISS for years to come. Experts now warn that the space degree will remain a danger for years to come, threatening satellites in low-Earth orbit, the heavily used region of space closest to Earth, as well as current and future space station crews. U.S. Space Com's initial assessment is that the debris will remain in orbit for years and uh, potentially for decades, posing a significant risk to the crew on the ISS and other human spaceflight activities, as well as multiple country satellite, U.S. Space Com said in a statement. In fact, about half of the fragments might fall to Earth within the next couple of years, but the remainder might remain hurtling through space for more than a decade. Hugh Lewis, head of the Aeronautics Research Group at the University of Southampton in the UK and Europe's leading space debris expert, told Space.com. Once the fragments are cataloged, I am expecting to see many close passes with satellites and other objects across a wide range of LEO. Uh, demonstrating the consequences of space safety, Lewis added. I would not be surprised if the ISS had to make collision avoidance maneuvers for the next couple of years as a direct result. Preliminary calculations suggest that the cloud of debris will increase the number of avoidance maneuvers performed like by more than 100% if in the next few years. Uh, Tim Floyer, head of the uh, ESA Space Debris Office, told Space.com. Quote, the peak can 
be even significantly higher than 100%, Floyer added. In this 400 to 500 kilometer altitude, the fragments will not survive long. We expect them to decay slowly over months and years, so the risk increase will still be significant after even one or two years. In addition to the impact that the debris will continue to have on the ISS station, SpaceX's internet beaming mega, mega constellation Starlink, currently comprising nearly 1,850 satellites, also orbits in the affected region. Experts and military le leaders appeared shocked by the act in general, which will once again affect long-term safety of all operations in low Earth orbit. Quote, Russia has demonstrated a deliberate disregard for the security, safety, stability, and long-term sustainability of the space domain for all nations, said U.S. Army General James Dixon and U.S. Space Command Commander that said in the USS, USSC statement. Continuing, the debris created by Russia's DAASAT will continue to pose a threat to activities in outer space for years to come, putting satellites and space missions at risk, as well as forcing more collision avoidance maneuvers. Once again, Russia. Mm. But here's the thing. Russia wasn't done saying stupid shit. Quote, On November 15th of this year, the Russia Defense Ministry successfully conducted a test, as a result of which the inoperative Russian uh, Selena D spacecraft, which had been in orbit since 1982, was struck, the Russian Defense Ministry said, according to Interfax. The United States knows for certain that the resulting fragments did not represent and will not pose a threat to orbital station spacecraft and space activities in terms of test time and orbit parameters. Russia space agency Roscosmos issued a separate statement on Tuesday, November 16th, which, however, does not directly mention the ASAT test. Quote, for us, the main priority has been and remains to ensure the unconditional safety of the crew, Roscosmos said in a statement. Adherence to this principle is laid both in the basis for the production of space technology in Russia and in the program of its operation. Okay. Well, its impact and consequences had drawn far more concern. This is not the first ASAT test in recent years. Like we said earlier, in 2019, India conducted an anti-satellite missile test, which, however, targeted a satellite that was actually much closer to Earth at only 175 miles. Most of the debris created by that strike therefore entered Earth's atmosphere within weeks, and some within months, according to Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. The impact of the Russian ASAT test, however, will be much more serious due to the higher altitude of the target strike. Debris from an ASAT test conducted by China in 2007, which targeted a satellite at an even higher altitude of 540 miles, is still a major source of collision hazard in low Earth orbit today. Now, all of this kind of leads to the Kessler syndrome. What? You, you you may not have heard of, of the Kessler syndrome before. Well, let's let's take a let's take a little moment and let's describe it. The Kessler syndrome is a phenomenon in which the amount of junk in orbit around Earth reaches a point where it just creates more and more space debris, causing big problems for satellites, astronauts, and mission planners. Consider this scenario. The destruction of a dead spy satellite spawns a swarm of debris in Earth orbit, which wrecks, uh, which wreaks ever increasing havoc, as it <laughs> zooms around, or around our planet. Sorry, I had to drop that little written house uh, defender joke in here. The cloud destroys a number of communication satellites, generating more and more debris with every violent collision. It even will take out the iconic Hubble Space Telescope and a NASA space shuttle, killing uh, several crew members aboard the winged vehicle. It then lines the International Space Station up in its crosshairs, destroying the $100 billion orbiting lab with a hail of fast-flying shrapnel. Now, that scene is more kind of like a dramatic scene. It's fictional, of course. Um, it's actually pulled from the award-winning 2013 sci-fi film Gravity. But many satellite operators, mission planners, and exploration advocates worry that it 
could be a dark window into the future that's all too real, thanks to the Kessler Syndrome. And the Kessler Syndrome is named after former NASA scientist Donald Kessler, who laid out the basic idea in a seminal 1978 paper. In that study, titled Collision Frequency of Artificial Satellites, the Creation of a Debris Belt, Kessler and co-author Burton Corpelli noted that the likelihood of satellite collisions increases as more and more spacecraft are lofted into orbit, and each such smash-up would have an outsized impact on the orbital environment. Satellite collisions would produce orbiting fragments, each of which would increase the probability of further collisions, leading to a growth of a belt of debris around the Earth. This debris flux is in such an Earth-orbiting belt could exceed the natural meteorite flux, affecting future spacecraft designs. The Kessler Syndrome describes and warms of a cascade of orbital debris that could potentially hinder humanity's space ambitions and activities down the road. Now, the original uh, paper predicted satellite collisions would become a source of space junk by the year 2000, if not sooner, unless humanity changed how it lofted payloads to orbit. But a timeline is not really not really essential to the, the core idea of the Kessler Syndrome. It was never intended to mean that the cascading would occur over a period of time as short as days or months, nor was it a prediction that the current environment was above some critical threshold, Kessler wrote in a 2009 paper that clarified the definition of the Kessler, uh, Kessler Syndrome and discussed its implications. Quote, the Kessler syndrome was meant to describe the phenomenon that random collisions between objects large enough to catalog would produce a hazard to spacecraft from small debris that is greater than the natural meteorite uh, environment. In addition, because the random collision frequency is nonlinear with debris accumulation rates, the phenomenon will eventually become the most important long-term source of debris unless the accumulation rate of larger non-operational objects in Earth orbit were significantly reduced. Now, before you think this guy has, has has an ego, Kessler didn't name the scenario after himself. It is actually in that uh, 2009 paper he explained that Kessler syndrome apparently originated with John Gabbard, a scientist with the North American Aerospace Defense Command, or NORAD, who kept an unofficial record of big satellite breakups in orbit. And no, no guys in chat, John Gabbard has no relation to mm, tall C. At least not that was real easy to find any real direct link between the two. And yes, yes, I spent some time looking that up. Now, Earth orbit is still getting more and more crowded as the years go by. Humanity has launched about 12,170 satellites since the dawn of the space age in 1957, according to the European Space Agency and 7,630 of them remain in orbit today, but only about 4,700 are still operational. That means there are nearly 3,000 defunct spacecraft zooming around Earth at tremendous speeds, along with other big, dangerous pieces of debris like upper-stage rocket bodies. For example, orbital velocity at 250 miles up, the altitude at which the ISS flies, is about 17,000 miles per hour. At such speeds, even a tiny shard of debris can do serious damage to spacecraft, and there are huge numbers of such fragmentary bullets sipping around our planet. ESA estimates that Earth orbit harbors at least 36,500 debris objects that are more than 4 inches wide, 1 million that are between 0.4 inches and 4 inches across, and a staggering 330 million that are smaller than 0.4 inches uh, but bigger than 0.04 inches. These objects pose more than just a hypothetical threat. From 1999 to May of 2021, for example, the ISS has conducted 29 debris-avoiding maneuvers, including three in 2020 alone, according to NASA officials. And that number continues to grow. The station performed another such move in November 2021, for example. Many of the smaller pieces of space junk were spawned by the explosion of spent rocket bodies in orbit, but others were more actively in place. In January 2007, for instance, China intentionally destroyed one of its defunct weather satellites in a much-criticized test of anti-satellite technology that generated 
more than 3,000 tracked debris objects and perhaps 32,000 others too small to be detected. The vast majority of that junk remains in orbit today. Spacecraft has, have also collided with each other in orbit. The most famous such incident occurred in February 2009 when Russia's defunct Cosmos 2251 satellite slammed into the operational communications craft Iridium-33, producing nearly 2,000 pieces of debris bigger than a softball. And as sad as all of this is to say, this was not the only debris incident in the last two weeks. For instance, in this, one, this case, last week, the ISS was forced to maneuver out of the way of a potential collision with space junk. With a crew of astronauts and cosmonauts on board, this required an urgent change of orbit on November 11th, four days before the Russian um, destroyed the satellite. So they knew they had to move the ISS because of debris four days before blowing up a satellite, and they still did it. Over the station's 23-year orbital lifetime, there have been about 30 close encounters with uh, debris requiring some sort of evasive action. Three of those near misses occurred in 2020. In May this year, there was actually a hit. A tiny piece of space junk punched a 5 millimeter hole in the ISS, uh, ISS's Canadian-built robot arm. Last week's incident involved a piece of debris from the defunct Fengyang 1C weather satellite destroyed in 2007 by a Chinese anti-satellite missile test. The satellite exploded into more than the 3,500 pieces of debris, most of which are still orbiting. Many have now fallen into the ISS's orbital range. To avoid the collision, a Russian Progress Supply spacecraft docked to the station, fired its rocket for over six minutes. This changed the ISS speed by 0.7 meters per second and raised its orbit already more than 400 kilometers high, by about 1.2 kilometers. 2007. And it impacted the ISS 14 years later. Let me clearly state for the record, and this is one of the few times you will ever hear me say this, I apologize for the language I am about to use. Fuck you, Russia, and your no-threat bullshit. Well, well, thank goodness we are done with debris stories. Uh, so with that, I think, we, I think it's time for a break. And I, I apologize for t literally taking up the whole show, or at least the first part of the show with talking about that. I, I wanted it on record. I wanted it, everyone to know just how thorough and in, in, in death this incident and other incidents and how much Russia is, is is lying about there's no threat because 14 years later with the China incident, it's now just impacting the ISS and other things. Russia's will probably within three or four years impact ISS and other other things. So when we get back, I do have some NASA news, SpaceX, uh, and of course everyone's favorite assholes in space segment. And who knows what else will lie ahead for the rest of the night. We'll be back in a few minutes. You are listening to KLRN Radio, America's podcast network. with my shelter pets, Frankie and Chance, reminding you that when you adopt a shelter pet, you discover all the things that make them unique. Adopt pure love at theshelterpetproject.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council, the Humane Society of the United States, and Maddie's Fund. Uh-oh, Brad's buzzed. Oh, yeah? Yeah, he's starting with the woots. <laughs> <laughs> and now a speech. I just want to say that friendship is about heart. Heart and brain. 
Who's with me? Good thing is, he knows when he's buzzed. And my brain is saying, when it's time to go home, somebody call me a ride. Love that guy. Me too. Know your buzzed warning signs? Call for a ride when it's time to go home. Buzz driving is drunk driving. A message from NHTSA and the Ad Council. Hi, this is J.E. Double F of In the Crease and Lost Wanderer here every Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on KLRN Radio, America's podcast network. My executive producer and I would like to wish you a happy holiday and Merry Christmas. Welcome back. Holy crap, what a what a first part of the show. It was it was a bit out of my norm to really deep dive that much into w- one basic story type, but but I really do feel it was important enough to get over and go through the events. And I'll take my uh podcast award whenever they want to hand me one. Wait, wait. Do they actually have podcast awards? Oh, anyway, on to the Second part of the show. The United States will send a crewed mission to the moon no earlier than 2025, NASA Chief Bill Nelson told reporters on Tuesday, officially pushing back the launch by at least a year. A target of 2024 was set by the administration of former President Donald Trump when it launched the Artemis program. But the program has since faced numerous development delays ranging from its vehicles to the space suits required. Last week, NASA did win a court case brought by Jeff Bezos' Blue Ball's origin, which sued after losing the lander contract to Elon Musk's uh, SpaceX. Quote, we lost nearly seven months in litigation, and that likely has pushed the first human landing likely no earlier than 2025, Nelson said on the call. The good news is that NASA is making solid progress, said Nelson, citing the fact that the Mauritian's mission's Orion crew capsule has since last week, been stacked t- atop the giant space launch system rocket at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. NASA is targeting a first uncrewed mission, Artemis 1, for February of 2022, and Artemis 2, the first crewed mission that will perform a flyby of the moon in 2024. Separately, SpaceX needs to carry out an uncrewed landing to test out the lunar version of its Starship rocket before the same vehicle is used for the crewed landing. Nelson revealed NASA has committed to a total development cost for Orion of $9.3 billion, which encompasses the period between 2012 and 2024, up from the previous estimate of $6.7 billion. But he warned more funding would be required from Congress to meet the new timelines, adding the Chinese space program is increasingly capable of landing Chinese taikonauts much earlier than originally expected. We are facing a very aggressive and good Chinese space program, he continued. It's the position of NASA, and I believe the United States government, that we want to be there first back on the moon about after half a century away, he added. Now, China, the world's second largest economy, has put billions into its military-run space program with hopes of having a permanently crewed space station by 2022. It has also sent rovers to the moon, including one to the far side, and is aiming for the first crewed lunar uh, landing mission by 2029. Humans last landed on the moon in 1972 on America's Apollo 17 mission. 1972. Do you know what happened in 72? President Richard Nixon visited China. Congressman Ford was sworn in as vice president. Championship winners, the Lakers 
beat the Knicks four games to one. Bruins beat the Rangers four games to two. The Oakland Athletics beat the Reds four games to three. And the Dallas Cowboys won a Super Bowl by beating the Dolphins 24 to three. Jack Nicholas won the U.S. Open. American Pie was the number one song, and The Godfather was the number one movie, and All in the Family was the number one TV show. And yeah, yeah, I'm feeling a bit old too. But but also, 49 years since a human on the moon. Well, that we, you know, that we kind of know of. But back to the moon. Sort of literally here. NASA will spend $93 billion on Artemis Moon Program. Or, yeah, $93 billion on Artemis Moon Program by 2025, a report estimates. Putting boots on the moon is an expensive proposition. NASA spending on its Artemis Program, which aims to establish a sustainable human presence on and around the moon by the end of the decade, is projected to reach a total of $93 billion by 2025. Moreover, while NASA has several initiatives underway aimed at increasing affordability, we project the current production cost of a single SLS Orion system to be $4.1 billion per launch. The IOG report states, referring to the Orion crew capsule and space launch system rocket, which are the core of the Artemis elements. Looking ahead, without capturing uh, uh, accurately reporting and reducing the cost of future SLS Orion missions, the agency will face significant challenges to sustain its Artemis program in its current configuration, added the 73-page report, which was released on Monday, November 15th. Now, I know before, before you complain too loudly, about the $93 billion. I think it might be good to have a little bit of perspective thrown in. For comparison, the U.S. spent $28 billion on NASA's Apollo moon program between 1960 and 1973. That adds up to $280 billion in today's money. So... We're actually lowering the cost decently. We could do a little better, but the cost is actually coming down. Now, although the Artemis program was first announced um, in December 2017, development of Orion and the SLS officially began in 2011. So the OIG reports $93 billion estimate encompasses more than a decade of spending from the fiscal year 2012 through the fiscal year 2025. The original plan to return to the moon called for landing astronauts near the moon's southern pole for the first time by 2028. In March of 2019, however, the administration of President Donald Trump accelerated things, retargeting the first crewed lunar lander since the Apollo days for 2024 and dubbing the initiative the Artemis program. That revised timeline was widely viewed within the space community as overly ambitious, and NASA is no longer working toward that. With, Matt, with Bill Nelson announcing it will be no earlier than 2025. But it should be noted, 2025 may be out of reach as well. The new OIG report, which was written, apparently written before Nelson's announcement, estimates that NASA will miss the Trump administration's late 2024 20, uh, landing goal by several years. The audit cites the need to develop and test new Artemis spacesuits, which are very behind schedule, and the program's HLS, which will ferry astronauts to and from the lunar surface. The first crewed Artemis landing mission is actually going to be called Artemis 3 because it will be the third launch in the program. As we touched on, the first Artemis 1 will send an uncrewed Orion on the journey around the moon. Artemis 2 will be a, a, a circumlunar mission, basically crew orbiting the moon. Um, but the IOG report is less bullish at estimating that the mission may be ready for the launch of summer 22 instead of February 2022 for the launch of the first Artemis. Such Artemis delays have multiple causes, according to the report, from technical challenges to the the COVID-19 thing to, honestly, extreme weather events. Like for this past August, for example, Hurricane Ida walloped NASA's McCowd Assembly Facility in, in uh, Louisiana, which builds the core stage for the SLS. In addition, the HLS and other Artemis element, the moon-orbiting space station known as Gateway, 
receive less money from Congress in fiscal year 2021 than required to meet NASA's initial acquisition strategy. The OIG report makes nine recommendations to Jim Free, who, as NASA's Associate Administrator for the Exploration Systems Development Mission Directorate, is overseeing Artemis. This advice is designed to improve the accuracy, transparency, and safety of human spaceflight. Well, you know, it seems most of the delays seem largely placed upon the, the shoulders of NASA and or the government agencies getting in the way. So it's I guess it's it's kind of I guess it's kind of good that we have a Zephyr and Cochrane. I mean, uh, Elon Musk and SpaceX, um, because SpaceX has just launched its fourth astronaut mission for NASA as part of the agency's commercial crew program. A slightly, slightly suity Falcon 9 rocket topped with a Crew Dragon capsule took to the skies above NASA's Kennedy Space Center on Wednesday, November 10th at 9.03 p.m., lighting up the night sky as it lifted off from the agency's historic Pad 39A. The launch kicked off SpaceX's Crew 3 mission, which will carry the four astronauts, NASA's Raja Shari, Tom Mashburn, and Caleb Barron, along with ESA's Matthias Maurer, on a 22-hour flight to the ISS. Following a series of weather, weather-related weather delays, the Crew 3 launch countdown proceeded smoothly, with the closeout crews completing critical leak and communication checks ahead of schedule. The crew seemed to relax and ready for action as the minutes ticked away. What a beautiful launch. NASA Associate Administrator Bob Cabana said during the live broadcast, it was another Great experience seeing those four take off in the space. And I gotta admit, it was a pretty pretty sweet looking launch. Once the Falcon 9's first stage engines ignited, the rocket put on quite a breathtaking show as the glow from the engines lit up the night sky. Quote, Sometimes when you try to fly on Halloween, you get a trick instead of a treat. Shari radioed SpaceX flight's controllers just before liftoff. He continued, or she, he. Uh, we, we're honored to fly Endurance on Veterans Day, and we're proud to represent the SpaceX and NASA teams as we live and work on the ISS for the next six months. The Crew 3 launch marked the 25th launch of the year here in Florida and the 24th so far this year for SpaceX. While the rocket was one of SpaceX's veteran flyers launching on its second mission, the Dragon Crew capsule was brand new. And additionally, it should be noted that the SpaceX rocket that carried the four astronauts in the orbit, including the 600th person, or included the 600th person to reach space in 60 years. Germany's Matthias Maurer actually gets to claim the number 600 position, according to NASA, based on his mission assignment. So, SpaceX has been really busy again. And finally, yes, yes, we have Starlink stories again. God, how many months has it been? So SpaceX launched its second rocket of the week, this time carrying a stack of Starlink satellites into orbit in a very foggy, uh, foggy flight. The previously flown Falcon 9 rocket blasted off from Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station at 7.19 a.m., marking the company's 25th launch of the year. It also marked that particular booster's ninth flight. Falcon has landed, SpaceX Dragon propulsion engineer Yumei Zhao said during live commentary. This marks the 87th overall successful recovery of a Falcon 9 first stage. This launch attempt comes just 24 hours after SpaceX was forced to delay due to a stormy condition at the Cape. Saturday morning started out with a layer of very dense fog hanging over the launch site, which slowly dissipated once the sun came up. Sitting on the launch pad, the rocket was actually very, very barely visible. But once it leaped off the pad and into the sky, the rocket was crystal clear to see in the in the skies. That successful liftoff marked the first SpaceX Starlink launch from Florida on one of its 229-foot-tall workhorse Falcon 9 rockets in six months. Although, although it should be noted, SpaceX did launch a Starlink mission um, from its California-based launch pad in September. So a few months still. The company attributes their, their brief law and Starlink launches to a rollout of new satellites, which are now equipped with freaking lasers. The, the laser-based systems, which will allow it to communicate with each other in orbit and less with the ground. To date, 
SpaceX has delivered more than 100,000 Starlink Internet terminals, and the service has not been approved to operate in at least 14 different countries, with applications pending in several others. In September, the company launched its first full set of satellites into a polar orbit, which will help the company provide access to people in higher latitudes. With the launch, SpaceX has now lofted 1,844 Starlink satellites into orbit, which goes well beyond the company's initial quota of 1,440. Um, however, they, they, the company has official approval for thousands of more. And we have potential further good news for SpaceX. SpaceX should soon have some clarity on the orbital launch prospects of its Starship Deep Space Transportation System. This summer, the U.S. Federal Aviation Administration began an environmental assessment of SpaceX's orbital launch activities at Starbase. SpaceX wants to conduct the first ever orbital test flight of a Starship vehicle from from Starbase soon, but that cannot happen until the FAA gets off its ass and wraps up the review. The timeline for that review has been quite vague, but Monday, November 15th, because apparently everything happened Monday, November 15th, the agency posted an estimated completion date of December 31st, 2021. That news actually seemed to cheer um, cheer up SpaceX founder and CEO Elon Musk, who has been rightfully critical of FAA regulations in the past. Quote, The hard work by the FAA, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and Texas Parks and Wildlife is much appreciated, as well as strong local support from Cameron County and Brownsville, South Padre, Musk said via Twitter on Monday. SpaceX is developing Starship to take people and cargo to the moon, Mars, and other distant destinations. Indeed, NASA astronauts will eventually ride Starship to the lunar surface a few years from now, if all goes according to plan. The agency recently selected Starship as the initial human landing system for the Artemis program. Musk would then go on to add, We intend to do, hopefully, a dozen Starship launches next year. Musk said during a live stream presentation at the joint fall meetings at the Space Studies uh, Board and Board on Physics and Astronomy, both of which are part of the U.S. National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. The company is targeting January or maybe February for its first Starship orbital launch attempt. So, wow. Look at how far we have made it into the show before we actually got to talk SpaceX. Can you tell the past two weeks have been really jam-packed with stories? And, and, you know, we we haven't even talked talked China. Wait, wait. Um, Being told by my executive producer... And now, assholes in space! China is asshole! China is asshole! I almost thought I was going to do a show without this segment, even though I kind of did tease it earlier, didn't I? I would have been tarred and feathered by chat for sure. So here we go. China launched the first set of three satellites for a new series of classified Yaogan reconnaissance satellites November 5th, continuing the country's rapid rate of orbital missions. Oh my God. They're actually kind of calling them spy satellites now. What? Chinese reconnaissance means uh, spying, right? Does in my book. A long March 2D lifted off at 10 p.m. Eastern, rising into the blue skies over the wooded hills surrounding the Zhichang Satellite Launch Center in southwest China. Chinese state media described the Yaogan 35A, B, and C satellites as to be used for scientific experiments, land and resources surveys, agricultural production estimates, and disaster prevention and mitigation. (laughs) China A, B, and C satellites. Very minimalistic. You know, I actually kind of respect that. Now, it is believed that the Yaogan satellites are for military purposes, similar to how Russia and the U.S. use Cosmos and the USA designations, respectively, for military satellites. The satellites are now orbiting at roughly 310 miles above Earth, with an inclination of 35 degrees, similar to to many of the earlier Yaogan series satellites, but with a slightly lower altitude. 
Unusually, the orbiting alga and trio were developed by separate groups. The A and B satellites were developed by aerospace Dongfang Hong, and I'm not making that name up, satellite company LTD, under the China Academy of Space Technology, while the C satellite was developed by Shanghai Academy of Space Flight Technology. Ironically, both with the moniker of CAST. That has to be confusing. And since I prefer C's, I'm going to say that one is going to be the one that's actually, you know, kind of spying on us. Unless you think that the Chinese are only spying on, say, the U.S., Taiwan, because, you know, separate country and all, or even the whole of the Earth. Nope, they have upped their spying game to include Mars. China's Tianwen-1 Mars orbiter has changed its orbit to begin a remote sensing survey of Mars after months of supporting the Zerong rover. The spacecraft has been orbiting Mars since February, and in May, Tianwen-1 released the Zerong rover for a successful landing attempt in Mars's Utopia Planetia. Or Planetia, yeah, we'll call it Planetia. Tianwen's one orbit saw it circle Mars three times every Martian day or Sol, including one pass overhead of the six-wheeled vehicle in order to relay data from Zhurong to Earth using its much larger antenna. Tianwen-1 one fired its engines for 260 seconds on Monday, November 8th, increasing its speed by 256 feet per second, according to the Shanghai Academy of Spaceflight Technology. This shifted the spacecraft from orbiting once every 8 hours and 12 minutes with the closest approach of 248 miles and highest point of 7,450 miles to orbiting once every 7 hours and 5 minutes with a parapsis of 165 miles and a apoposis of um, 6,500 6, miles. Tianwen-1 carries seven scientific payloads, including medium and high-resolution cameras for both mapping large areas of Mars and returning sharper, more focused image of the planet's surface. The Mars Orbiter Surface Investigation Radar, or MOSER, a sounding radar, will meanwhile scout for water ice beneath the surface. Targets of particular interest include impact craters, volcanoes, and canyons. Tianwen-1 also carries a mineralogical spectrometer for detailing surface composition, particle analyzers for atmospheric studies, and a magnetometer. Um, it, its orbit passes over the poles, meaning that over time, as the spacecraft orbits and the pl uh, planet rotates, Tian 1 1 will be able to survey the entire surface of the planet. Now, the spacecraft has a designed lifetime of two Earth years, but Tian 1 could be set for extended activity. At the end of next year, when the orbiter's design lifetime comes towards its end, we'll design new missions based on the specific conditioners of the orbiter and will then lower its orbit for closer observation of Mars and obtain more exploratory data, Zhu Jinbo, Deputy Chief Designer of the Orbiter, told CCTV. The data for Tianwen-1 will also be used for informing and planning future Mars missions, including the very ambitious Chinese Mars sample return attempt that could launch as soon as 2028. And in the Department of, hmm, China is building a specifically designed ship for launching rockets into space from the seas in an effort to boost its capacity to launch satellites and recover rocket stages. The 533-foot-long, 131-feet-wide new type rocket launching vessel is being constructed for use with the new China Oriental Spaceport at Heihang, Shandong Province on the eastern coast. The new ship is expected to enter service in 2022. It will feature integrated launch support equipment and be capable of facilitating launches of the Long March 11, larger commercial Smart Dragon rockets, and in the future, liquid propellant rockets, according to social media channel for the spaceport. The vessel could also in the future be used for the recovery of first stages, possibly in the same way as SpaceX's autonomous spaceport drone ships provide a landing platform for Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy rocket first stages. China has already conducted two sea launches of Long March 11 solid rockets from the Yellow Sea using converted barges, with the most recent launch taking place in September of 2022. These missions made China only the third country to perform a sea launch following the U.S. and Russia. China, China's main space contractor stated at the start of the year that it planned two to three sea launches of the Long March 11, but none have taken place so far. It is not known if plans for the new ships are related to the apparent delays. The ship 
will help boost the rate at which China can launch from the sea and ease the pressure on China's four main launch centers. And, you know, maybe, maybe it will cause, you know, not as many deaths to cows and people with, you know, failed launches. I guess that can be the, a good thing, right? So, so far, in 2021, China has already launched 41 times so far, setting a new national record for orbital launches in a calendar year, leading the U.S., which has 39 launches a day, if you include the rocket lab launches from New Zealand. Since it's a, an American company, I, I'm including it. With new commercial companies emerging and major constellation plans in the work, along with preparations for major space station missions, the sea launch option will provide more routes to orbit. Launching from the sea holds promises, uh, uh, promising other advantages for China. Flexible positioning of the launch site means it's easier to choose a flight path which doesn't fly over other countries and make sure spent rocket stages and other debris fall into the sea rather than on the land. Debris from launches from China inland sites fall to ground rather than sea and sometimes, sometimes, close to populated areas. Ah, uh, hey, there it is. They're trying to stop killing the cows. And maybe some people. Who knows? With that, I think we have time for maybe maybe one one more story. Wait, wait. Nope. Being told by the executive producer, we don't have time for one story or the other ten or so we have we want to do. Well, crap. You know, I guess we'll just have to do another episode right after Al does circumspice the right side of Michigan. Fair enough. Well, with that, we'll see you in an hour. For the Lost Wonder, the Intergalactic Kegger After Show Show. The universe is a pretty big place. It's bigger than anything anyone has ever dreamed of before. So if it's just us, it seems like an awful waste of space. Right? When I was young, it seemed that life was so wonderful A miracle Oh, it was beautiful and magical And all the birds in the trees Well, they'd be singing so happily Oh, joyfully Oh, playfully Watching me But then they said